Okay, so um, before we move on to the next panel, I just have two quick plugs that I would like to make for our students. Um, number one, most of everybody should have gotten a survey uh, when they registered. Um, this would greatly help our students if you guys don't mind taking a couple minutes just to fill this out and then inserting it into the box at the front. Um, it, it will help them with their, their conceptual as well as applied research. Um, also, I found out that a few of the panelists as well as moderators are leaving early. Can I just show of hands who else is not planning on staying until the end for <laughs> yourself? <laughs> Only speakers in Palace. Are you also? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Then without further ado, I'll hand this over to you. Okay. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks for the invitation. My name is Steve Lickey. I work with uh, Fraser Basin Council. It's, this is a, a not-for-profit, non-government organization with a mandate to advance sustainability across British Columbia, but with a focus on the, the Fraser River Basin. And, and part of my interest today and with respect to resilience has to do with integrated flood hazard management. One of the initiatives that we're facilitating and helping to coordinate is a development and, and implementation of a lower mainland flood management strategy. Before, I'm just going to talk a little bit about that and then introduce the, the panelists. But first I want to clarify the role of the Fraser Basin Council. We, are, we have no regulatory role, no legislative authority, so that situates us well as an impartial facilitator. So we can be multi-interest, multi-jurisdictional processes without a particular regulatory stick. We're in a good position to bring together the different interests, different disciplines to work on complex sustainability issues for which there is no single jurisdiction responsible, such as flood management. A little bit on the, the flood strategy. Uh, this aims to reduce vulnerability of communities and infrastructure across the lower mainland uh, and increase resilience uh, and, and through uh, flood mitigation. The, the region of interest, the lower mainland, essentially for this initiative extends from Hope to Richmond and from White Rock to Squamish. And we're focused on, on two primary flood hazards of regional significance, including the spring freshet on the Fraser River during the snow melt in the spring, as well as winter coastal storm surge floods. In phase one, we undertook some work to better understand those flood hazards and the influence of climate change on those flood hazards. We took a look at the vulnerability of this region in terms of, of damage and disruption to buildings, infrastructure, the agriculture sector, population, uh, etc. And, and took a look also at current, the current state of flood protection infrastructure policies and practices. Now we're moving into the fun stuff, and that is to grapple with uh, priorities uh, through a regional lens, looking at what would be appropriate flood mitigation alternatives, uh, and to look at cost sharing and funding and decision-making arrangements. And I guess where, this, where resilience comes in is we want to undertake this work through a variety of different lenses. Certainly integrated flood hazard management, uh, resilience is another important lens. Sustainability, how can we better integrate environmental considerations uh, in this work? Uh, and certainly climate adaptation. Um, so that's a bit of an introduction on, on that regional scale work. And really I want to acknowledge our partners. Uh, they're the real strength of this initiative and, and certainly the three municipalities that represent it here are real leaders uh, in this region and, and really bring the, the strength uh, to this initiative in terms of sharing data, uh, expertise, and they're really on the, the front lines in terms of implementation. So I'll, I'll shift here. So now I'm going to introduce all three speakers uh, and then uh, turn it over to them. Um, I'll start with Tamsin Lyle, who is a principal and founding engineer with Ebwater Consulting, which is a Vancouver-based company wholly focused on flood management. And over her academic and professional career, she's developed uh, in-depth technical <coughs> knowledge around flood mechanisms along with a broad understanding of flood policy and planning. Now she works on these issues across the country, a number of technical working groups, uh, and really encourages a holistic and integrated approach to flood management. And she was the technical lead for the recently completed City of Vancouver Coastal Flood Risk Assessment, and she's here on behalf of City of Vancouver. Our second speaker is Maggie Bainham. Maggie is the sustainability planner for the city of Surrey. And through her work in the sustainability office, she has supported efforts to establish Surrey as a leader in climate action. Between 2011 and 13, she led the development of Surrey's climate adaptation strategy and has been supporting and monitoring its implementation over the past couple of years. 
and Maggie graduated from UBC School of Community and Regional Planning, where her studies focused on the integration of climate policy into community planning efforts. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have uh, Lloyd B. with the, the City of Richmond. Lloyd is a professional engineer with 27 years of experience in infrastructure planning and design. His career includes both public and private practice with a number of companies and municipalities, including City of Vancouver, City of Richmond, of course, EarthTech Engineering, and AECOM. His current position with Richmond is Manager of Engineering plan and Planning, and his current projects include Dyke Master Planning for long-term <coughs> climate change, do sea level rise, water system pressure management, aging infrastructure assessment, and automated meter reading for water meters. So without further ado, I'll invite uh, Tamsin up. Hello everybody. Uh, my name's Tamsin. I'm not the Tamsin from the city of Vancouver. There are two Tamsins. <laughs> I'm the original senior Tamsin. that <laughs> engineer Tamsin. Um, so when I'm standing in fairly last minute here, so apologies if this is not the most cohesive, uh, best presentation. And secondly, I need to say that I'm not an employee of the city of Vancouver, and I can't really speak broadly later on to their strategies and thinking around resilience. But what I can speak about is the project that I did work on with them for the last two, well, for three or four years, um, looking at sea level rise and adaptation in the city of Vancouver. So that's where I'm going to give you a snapshot <coughs> today. And I think. Um, for me, this is a really good opportunity because I've been working in floods for years and years and years. Um, Steve, you know, 20 years ago, he helped me with my thesis when I was at SFU. Um, and uh, over time, like we, I, it's clear that as Canadians, we're not necessarily very resilient to floods. We've made a lot of mistakes in terms of how we manage floods. And so I actually see climate change as an opportunity to change how we think about floods, how we plan for floods, how we make decisions about floods, and ultimately, how we become more resilient to flood. So I'm going to try and pilot some of those today. So flooding, my favorite topic, um, is, a, is, is, a, is a traditional classic wicked problem. It's got all of the things going on. It's very complex, it's highly technical, all of these dimensions of uncertainty, how much water is coming down, what does the river look like, lots of objectives, lots of emotion. If you've ever been um, in an area that has been flooded, Immediately after the flood, the emotions are extremely high, which obviously um, lends, you know, tr trades off in terms of how we actually manage and react to floods. Um, and it's obviously very, well, if this is not obvious, but I will make it obvious to you at some point today, um, there's very limited resources in Canada to manage this. Um, however, I'll get to that in a minute. We do have climate change, which is kind of changing how we're thinking about things, and is also offering a little bit of an opportunity for funding. But anyways, one of the things that I wanted to note is that climate change um, is really affecting how we think about floods because we're now having to manage for more than one design condition. So traditionally in Canada, we've managed for a single event. So we've looked at a single standard design event of a 200 year flood or a 500 year flood or a 100 year flood, and we've made all of our decisions based on that. But if you have climate change, you can't do that anymore because we're changing um, everything is non-stationary. And so we're dealing with two separate design conditions as we look into the future. So obviously with sea level rise, the base water level is going up. So there's some areas that are totally dry today, they're gonna be wet all the time in the future. And also on top of that, we're dealing with storms. So there's areas that currently are dry today, but maybe tomorrow when we have a big coastal storm, uh, will be underwater. But as we move further into the future, that whole um, storm system will move further and further inland. So we have these two different design conditions that we now have to plan for. We can't just plan for a big storm event anymore. We have to think into the future about these areas that will be consistently underwater. And so for Vancouver, this is an important issue, although sitting next to these guys, <laughs> Vancouver's got no problems. <laughs> so when Lloyd gets up with his map, this entire thing's going to be blue. But so this is about the map of Vancouver. Most of you have been familiar with this at this point. Um, and on this side is what the, the, the fine floodplains for today. So the blue areas are areas that we would expect to be underwater in a large storm event today. So there are some really big swaths of Vancouver that are currently quite vulnerable to flooding. And then if you look into the future, to the year 2100, the main big difference you see is over in the False Creek Flats there. We're at large swaths of land that have huge pieces of infrastructure, lots of all of our um, food, uh, food bank, all of the, of the train station, there's a ton of things in that area um, that will be underwater in the future. And so these are the two extreme design scenarios. But when we think back to those 
base case, the other design condition that we're planning for, we need to think about that sort of increase in base water level, so what we're going to see at high tide. And this is our future under high tide in the year 2100. So what we see today is a big storm is our future in terms of where the water will be once a year, three times a year, and as we move further into the future daily, we're going to see water in these areas. And there's some, it, there's some places that we need to highlight, like Granville Island, if you're if you're from Germany and you're, you're touristy here, you will have been to Granville Island, it'll be underwater. Our Olympic Village, brand new Olympic Village, will be underwater. <coughs> However, the city of Vancouver, my wonderful client, um, recognized this very early that this was an issue. And so when they did their adaptation plan in 2012, they identified coastal flooding as a priority and have since gone on to do two studies. Similar to the Fraser Basin Council study, the first one focused on hazard. And you said second study was <coughs> I know, but you said so you had a good word. I can't remember, but I'm going to call it the juicy part of the <laughs> study was the second one. <laughs> the second study. So the first study we really looked at where the water would be. That was all the engineering studies, the hydraulics. And the second study is when we started to think about well, what does this mean, and how do we manage it? Manage it. What are our pathways forward? And so in 2014, the city hired a bunch of consultants, including myself. Um, to try and look at this problem, to try and establish what uh, management alternatives we had um, to try and uh, manage our changing hazard and risk. And these went to council last November, although the project was actually finished a year before that. All of the reporting is now available on the city website, so you can have a look if you want. Um, but what we tried to do was try to take that resiliency lens to try and think about all of these things that I heard Lloyd saying earlier in terms of the values of the people and the citizens. And so to do that, we wanted to think about the decision structure that we took uh, not being traditional. So we weren't looking to do cost-benefit analysis. We wanted to try and recognize all the things that make us resilience in our decision process, and we employed structured decision-making to do this. I am not a structured decision-making expert, so I just stole um, a very long slide from the Council of Management to describe what structured <coughs> decision-making is. But basically, it's just a framework to allow you to think about trade-offs between management alternatives that are values-led. So we didn't want to focus just on dollars and cents. We wanted to focus on the values of the community, of the people who live in Vancouver. The other thing we tried to do is we tried to be aspirationally. We tried to be risk-based. And so by that, I mean, we didn't just try and think about design for a single standard. We wanted to think about what that standard meant in terms of the impacts to the people on the ground. So we really tried to focus on impacts and consequences rather than just designing a single standard. And the second thing we tried to do was to consider more than one design condition. Like going back to the beginning, we have the scenario where traditionally you would have just designed to a 200 year flood level. We said, well, that doesn't make sense. We should be designing for the 10 year, the 20 year, the 30 year, the 40 year, all of these interim um, events because they're going to happen more and more and more frequently. And on top of that, we have the layer of uncertainty. So there's a lot of math, and you're welcome to read our report to, to look at the math. And like I just said, we wanted to really focus on more than dollars and cents, because Vancouver, as people who come here, as if you're visiting, you probably didn't come to Vancouver to look at our infrastructure, although maybe this group did. Um, you probably came to Vancouver because we have beaches, you know, we have this, the green atmosphere, and all these things that make Vancouver and the region really special um, needed to be included in our decision. And so the way we did that is we tried to um, come up with measures that looked at all these different values that are more than just dollars and cents. And we were, of course, constrained by time, money, data, methods. In fact, many of these intangible things are rarely considered in flood um, management decisions. And as such, we actually had to innovate new ideas. Basically, we have to make stuff up because there was nothing for us to lean on. And these are just some of the many um, uh, measures that we used. And it's really important to consider these measures because whichever measure and Matt's not in the room, but I, he always says, what measures matters. We're going to say this many times in presentation. And it's true. And I'm just going to run through some of the results to show you how that played out in this particular project. So one of the things um, the city of Vancouver was very keen on um, from a council level was the fact that we have a lot, of little, a lot of vulnerable populations in the city. We have the downtown east side, for example. Um, it's actually where I live, so I can talk about it blatantly. Um, and we wanted to recognize that that was something that we needed to consider when we were making decisions about flooding. And so I want you to look at this map, and so this is the hotspot map, so it shows the areas that would be flooded where the vulnerable populations are, and look where the brightest pink is. 
If we choose a different measure, we look at you know, one of our environmental measures, contaminants, you see that the whole, like, the whole story has kind of shifted. So we've moved away from the downtown east side, and now the area of interest is False Creek and the further shore where our industrial areas are. Moving again to a sort of more traditional measure that you would use, the dollars and cents associated with damages to buildings, and the story shifts again to the downtown core to Granville Island. So we need to consider all of these things as a whole, because if we just consider one of these measures, we're going to make very different decisions. So we need to adapt thoughtfully based on all of these different values. And traditionally, we've tried to block the water. We've tried to reduce the hazard. But we can't continue to fight nature. And I think if, if Steve could talk more, he would say that we've got a problem because we're managing, we're, we're talking now about raising the dikes up higher and higher and higher. But the higher the dikes go, the faster they fall because they, they just can't, they can't hold themselves up anymore. So we can't continue to fight nature. But we also have to recognize that we have people and economic drivers and environmental areas that are on our floodplains. We can't sterilize them either at this point. We need our floodplains. So how do we manage that? Well, we move towards the resilience end of the spectrum by reducing our sensitivity to the built environment and thinking about how we can recover more quickly. And so those are the th kind of things that we try to consider, although we did consider an enormous toolbox of options. We divided the city up into 11 zones. We had about 40 toolboxy options. And we looked through them all and tried to figure out what would be the best for each area using a structured decision making approach. So we did use, we did look at all the big engineering options, but we also looked at some of the sort of more uh, building control level, the very simple ideas that you can do over time as your infrastructure turns over in terms of uh, property level resilience and resistance. And then we threw them all onto these tables called constant tables. And again, you can look in the report to have um, to see how these work. But basically, what happens here is that we, for each of our neighborhood zones, we chose between three and five options to consider, and they're across the top. And then for each of those measures I showed you earlier, they're down the side here. And blue is good, orange is bad. It's colorblind friendly, apparently. I don't know if there's any colorblind in the audience, you can actually confirm that for me, but this is what I can pull. Blue good, orange bad. So in our baseline case, if we do nothing in False Creek, for example, well, we have a lot of impacts when the flood event comes. But the actual management initiative or impact, management action, doing nothing, has no real impact associated with it. Whereas if we go for these big engineering type options, like a sea barrier across False Creek, or raising the, the seawall very, very high, we can stop the water getting wet, we can stop all of those impacts in the moment of the flood. The management action itself has a really important um, impact, and that I think is what Stephen Shepherd's work is showing. So having that dike across the, the, the Kitsilano Beach, for example, means that people can't see the water anymore. So what does that mean? So we need to consider how these things work together. So what are some of the other options? Well, we looked at sort of the halfway option of half a dike. Um, so it protects some things, um, but it, it it protects some things, but it doesn't cost as much, so it has some advantages, but doesn't really doesn't really play out as a very good solution. And we also look at the adaptation options, like those the raising buildings and the planning tools that we could use. So again, it doesn't really protect everything sort of to its fullest, but the impacts, <coughs> but the impacts of the management action itself in terms of long-term resilience are actually quite positive. So if you look at all of these things across the board, the preferred action or the trade-offs between them suggests that maybe a big engineered solution is not the way to go. And so what do we do for the city of Vancouver? You're gonna have to look at the report because I've only got 10 minutes. Um, but for each of these 11 zones, we have got these consequence tables that outline the trade-offs between the various options um, and some preferred options. But something we didn't really answer was when to take action, although we have some tools in place to help with that. So if we, even, if we know what to do, so for example, if we decided to build a big engineered option in Falls Creek, um, it's going to cost a lot of money, um, and when do we put it in? Because if we put things in too early, well, we're spending a lot of money today based on uncertain information. Maybe sea level rise will actually go up six meters over the next hundred years as opposed to one meter in the next hundred years. So we're probably going to make that decision. So we need to try and push our decision point out to the point where we actually really have to make a decision so that we're not wasting funds and putting in big dikes that are blocking people's views today for no good reason. But if you're too late in terms of when you put that action in, well, you're gonna have lots of um, catastrophic events. So find the sweet spot on that timeline. 
It's really, really important. And that needs a lot of thoughtful thinking about the rates of uncertainty that we see in climate change today. So one of the, basically what we have suggested to the city of Vancouver is some timelines for when decisions actually have to made, be made. And if you're looking at the big um, engineered options, we've uh, factored in the fact that it's probably going to take 10 years to build, 20 years to finance. So when we've looked at when you need to make a decision about which path you're actually going to follow. But in the meantime, we suggested that you don't, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking for I'm going to jump over this one. <coughs> that you need to preserve the options into your future. So we don't need to make a lot of these decisions today, but we don't want to stop ourselves being able to put a barrier in 50 years from now. So we don't want to build condos along the shore where we might want to put a dike in the future. We want to preserve our options into the future to the point where we're actually going to have to make decisions. <coughs> so our final recommendations focus on preserving options, decreasing vulnerability and exposure, and engaging with communities and partners like yourself. That's it. Thanks, Harrison. And next up, we have Big Baby Bainer. Yes, sir. Compliments um, Tamsin's work really well. I'm not an engineer, so I don't have as much of the technical background. Um, but we're, what we're doing um, is similar in terms of process and, and thinking uh, to what Tamsin was describing for the city of Vancouver. Um, so I'm going to start by talking, I'm going to first give a little bit of, of context about Surrey. I think people are often less familiar with us as a municipality than Vancouver. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about us as a municipality and our, our approach to thinking about sustainability and resilience and then um, get into a couple of the pieces that we've been doing uh, around implementation on our adaptation strategy. Uh, it's going to be a high-level flyby because it's hard to talk about any one of those projects in much detail in 15 minutes, but I'm happy to answer more questions after the fact. Um, so you can see from this map that Surrey is uh, geographically very large. We're uh, more than 300 square kilometers, and I think Vancouver, Richmond, and um, Burnaby all fits within our, our geographic extent. Um, we've got, we're growing very rapidly as well, almost 10,000 new people move here every year uh, and we are at about 520,000 people as of uh, 2016. And we're really a city of communities, so we're here, uh, city centre up here, um, but there's uh, five town centres, uh, we're really trying to focus density across the, across the uh, city. Um, and a very diverse, large immigrant uh, community, which is really important in thinking about how social capital is built um, among those, those communities. Um, we're a mix of urban, rural, and, and a legacy of suburban development, um, with a lot of ecologically significant areas as well. So all of these factors are important in thinking about how we, um, what kinds of approaches are used in different areas. <coughs> And when, I think when you talk about resilience, it's also, I mean, affordability is um, becoming such an, an issue in this region, and uh, increasingly energy um, is becoming a, a bigger portion of what, what families and uh, residents are spending um, from their income. So that, that is, and I'll talk a little bit about energy resilience um, later, but it, uh, one of the co-benefits of, of taking action um, in the work that we've been doing. Um, in terms of thinking about a flooding, um, you can see here the blue is the floodplain. We've got 54 kilometers of shoreline and over 25% of our land area is within the floodplain. Um, the north is dominated by industrial uses uh, and the south is uh, largely coincides with our agricultural land. And we're lucky in that respect in that, uh, very unlike Vancouver, you said that we're in trouble, but. Um, I think we're quite lucky in the fact that we don't have much residential development in our floodplain. Plain. Um, Crescent Beach, which you guys, some of you anyways, will be visiting later today, um, is within the floodplain, so there's about 1,500 residents uh, that are exposed. So we, um, 
back in 2011, we began the process of developing a community climate action strategy, uh, which was adopted by Council in 2013, and is comprised of two parts, so the mitigation or energy um, and, and carbon reduction piece, and then the adaptation strategy, looking at climate change and how we can be prepared for, for the unavoidable impacts. Um, and our role within the, the sustainability office um, is certainly not to implement everything in these pieces. It really happens across the organization uh, and requires that all, um, many different departments play a role in that. Uh, but we do help with the coordination across uh, departments, the communication, reporting, um, and then leading often parts that uh, don't necessarily find a natural home within uh, the organization. So from our adaptation strategy, we identified a number of, uh, of impacts, climate projections, um, which I'm sure you're familiar with in terms of um, var variability and uncertainty, uh, larger storm events, rising temperatures, precipitation, sea level rise, et cetera. Don't need to get into all of that. Um, but what kind of bubbled to the surface in terms of our biggest risks as a city um, were flooding and drainage issues, by far the, the most important. Um, but tree mortality and ecosystem change, a huge issue. Um, and and we, uh, we have you know, uh, begun to observe some of the impacts of, of uh, the droughts from recent summers, um, as well as you know, wetter soils and things like that. Um, and then viability of agriculture and food insecurity. Uh, we have, that's a huge industry. We provide food for the region, we export a lot. Um, so not just the livelihood of those farmers, um, but also food security more broadly. <clears throat> so planning for resilience and climate adaptation is becoming increasingly embedded within the city's policy documents. And I liked um, what I think Leslie mentioned about one of the major outcomes from the study being around that mainstreaming piece and how that really sets municipalities up to uh, perform and, and to deliver on these pieces. And so um, we, the first sustainability charter, which was adopted in 2008, first gave us direction to go ahead and, and begin planning for uh, the impacts of climate change. Uh, and so we, um, uh, so, so it was really important policy mandate embedded within sustainability to, to move those pieces forward. Um, but it's also uh, turned around and since the charter was first um, uh, created, we've updated our OCP and resilience um, and adaptation, or sorry, resilience and sustainability um, are embedded there as well in terms of the way it's framed um, and, uh, and within the actual policies as, uh, themselves. And that of course um, informs our neighborhood concept plans, our 10 year servicing plan, um, our engineering department carries here in the back as a huge champion of this work and actually created a section within their servicing plan that's dedicated to climate change um, so that it, we can be resourcing the studies and um, upgrades that we need within that. Um, there's also, the, if you're taking action on biodiversity laws, you're taking action on climate change. I love that. Um, and that really is, we rely on the implementation of our bio, landmark biodiversity uh, conservation strategy that was created um, a couple of years ago to uh, basically strategically, uh, first we identified all of the hubs and sites and corridors that would be required in order to maintain our biodiversity um, and are now strategically um, acquiring them and having them dedicated through development um, to, to ensure that those, that we can maintain that healthy ecosystem. Um, and then, you know, the, the Charter out of is very visionary, high level, very much charter language. Um, but all these pieces feed together to the more granular plans. Um, and and you know, five years ago, I um, I would have you know talking about sea level rise and um, very openly and publicly and, and leading a huge public engagement processes around that specific that specific issue. Um, you know, I knew it had to happen, but it was hard to imagine it happening. And now we are in the midst of that. So. Um, the, this, this change is happening, and um, we, I'll, I'll talk about the coastal flood adaptation strategy um, shortly. So I think I've, I've talked probably enough about this, but this is just um, the way that our uh, sustainability charter is organized around these um, eight themes. And I was actually looking through it yesterday and saw resilience is specifically um, described as desired outcomes in five of those eight, um, five of those eight themes. And similarly, this is the, these are the, um, 
mm -hmm. the visionary elements for the for the official community plan and resilience is um, is one of those as well. So I was thinking about um, the differences between um, resilience and sustainability and how we approach it. And, and it was interesting to think back on the work that's happened and which have been really framed and driven by resilience at risk specifically, um, and which are kind of positioned as a co-benefit. Co uh, and I think both are important, and, and it's all part of kind of the layering and packaging of, um, of, of, uh, of these actions. Um, but for, for sure, the work that we've been doing on planning for sea level rise, um, understanding the, uh, the, the design of our new infrastructure and how those can be um, adaptable for uncertainty, um, resilience is a really important lens to be putting on it. I think may be more helpful in some ways than thinking about sustainability. Because resilience, you really do need to think about uncertainty and plan for any number of futures. Um, and, I, and I would love to see that happening across more of our um, decision making. Um, I think it's, it's easier when you're thinking about infrastructure, um, but it's a, it's a useful lens to think about planning for any number of futures. Um, the Shade Tree Management Plan, uh, which was uh, adopted last year, um, also has mitigation and adaptation as core framing for that document. Um, so really, really great to see it being mainstreamed across um, our planning documents. Um, but a lot of a lot of um, the work that the city does isn't necessarily framed in terms of. Um, uh, it, or adaptation specifically, although it is building resilience in a lot of ways. So we're doing a lot in terms of, um, of having more ownership and around energy and, and energy production here in Surrey. So we are building a biofuel facility. Um, there's district energy here in city center. Um, city Hall is on a geothermal uh, a geothermal system. Uh, so so these pieces, when, I'm when you're thinking about affordability, you're thinking about um, all of the money that is currently leaving our community to pay for energy, I think was projected to be up to a billion dollars um, in the coming decades. All of that can be retained here in the city um, if we think about being more self-sufficient in these ways. Um, <clears throat> increasing community food production, which you know, doesn't just have benefits in terms of food security, but also that um, the social capital and, and connection piece, which is uh, really important. And that, that is uh, true too of the community engagement and, and connections. Um, and the biodiversity conservation strategy as well, it was, it was developed in, in tandem to the adaptation strategy. It doesn't talk about climate change in really um, definitive terms within the document itself, but its implementation is certainly helping build resilience within the city. <coughs> So I'm going to switch gears now and talk um, about some of the specific um, initiatives that we have underway. Um, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the coastal flood adaptation strategy. So I think that will be relevant background information for those of you who are going down to Crescent Beach um, this afternoon. Um, but flooding has always been um, an, an issue in Surrey. It's something that we have learned to manage over decades and decades. This is in um, 1968. Uh, this is where the picture is taken. So you're looking uh, west towards uh, Boundary Bay, Mud Bay here. Uh, and we manage flooding with a very complex system of dikes and flood boxes and floodgates and spillways. Um, and I'm not going to get into all of that right now. Um, but that is to say that we're not new in this, to this territory. <coughs> However, it doesn't mean that we can continue dealing with these issues in the same way that we always have. Um, this is, um, you've heard reference to the one meter of sea level rise by 2100. Uh, that's kind of the planning horizon that we're looking at and that was uh, from guidance from the province um, a few years ago. Um, so you can see, you know, we've only seen a, a small amount of the sea level rise. We also experienced subsidence where our ground is sinking to date. Um, and that curve is, is um, moving up, I don't know, exponentially, but quickly. Um, and here across the top, you can see the major uh, coastal and river flood events. So the river ones are in dark blue and the coastal ones are in lighter blue. 
and there has been increasing numbers of those in recent years. Um, so we are expecting um, to see more frequent and intense um, uh, I don't know if any of you saw outside on the first floor, we've just put up a huge um, visual poster of what we will have to be raising the dikes to um, if we are to meet the guidance on um, uh, like the freeboard and planning for wave effect and things like that. And so there's a choice. Do we, do we, the building dikes has been the de facto um, to date and likely will be at least a portion of how we deal with this issue in the, in the future. But we don't want to assume that that is the only way um, or the best way at this point. Uh, you can see here, this is a map of our, of our flood infrastructure. Our, dike, our, uh, our dikes are all in uh, these little dots. Um, and already today, we're seeing, that's the, the dark red, we're seeing that um, our dikes are vulnerable to flooding. They're already too low for today's standards um, and are at risk. And by 2040, the orange dots, um, basically all of our flood infrastructure will be at moderate to high risk of overtopping. So, you know, coming back to Tamsin's question of, you know, what is the right timing? We know at least it's not out to 2100 that we're thinking about in terms of this infrastructure, but it's, it's a shorter time uh, a timeline that we that we need to be thinking ahead to. So um, part of what engineering has done over the past few years is extensive um, studies to better understand both the impact um, as well as the timing of these flood events. And currently, oh, my time is up. <laughs> I'm going to go over. I'm sorry. Um, currently, <laughs> today. Give you one minute. Okay. <laughs> We are experiencing 0.5% um, of an extreme flood um, today. So an extreme